The choir was singing praises so beautifully. Thank you very much. Let us all pray together. Thank you, dear Lord, who loves us. While we did not know you, you have loved us first. And by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you pay the wages of our sins once for all so that we won't be condemned anymore. For your amazing love and grace, we thank you with our whole heart. May the Holy Spirit be with us here in this time and please work in our hearts. If there's anybody who have questions or doubts, please help them to solve them. And please help us to stand fast on the foundation of your word. And also help us to share your precious gospel with our beloved family members and relatives. When we stand before you someday later, we want to be praised and we want to receive glory and honor. So please rule in our life. Please help us and be with us in our in all, all our life. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Verse 13, I'm going to read. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Yes, up to there. Today, only if we had more time, I uh, I would have shared more about the kingdom of heaven. But we have to finish this session by twelve thirty because there is a Lord's Day supper that was prepared. So uh, today, I'm going to share more about the Christian life, uh, what we ought, how we ought to live as a born again Christian. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, it says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write. Here it says, Write. And that implies that this is a very important message. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. Here it says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Why did he say it? Because there would be many who die out of the Lord. When a man is born in this world, he is born in Adam. A man is born into this world with a cry a baby is born with a cry, and the baby is born in Adam. So when a baby is born, he is born as a sinner. There is no baby who is born smiling or laughing. From the moment a baby is born, he cries. So cry starts from the very moment of birth. And for 70 or 80 years of life, he has many sorrows and sadness and tears as it is written in the Bible, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. So the, the longer a man lives, the more suffering he faced. So a man who is born in Adam and dies in Adam is actually uh, miserable. Even if he became a president of a country or a secretary of a country or a CEO of a big um, conglomerate, as soon as he crossed the river of death, everything goes down to zero. And he cannot carry anything in his hand. 
when he dies, and he will go into the everlasting fire. As it is written in the Bible in Ecclesiastes, as he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return, to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a severe evil. Just exactly as he came, so shall he go, and what profit has he who has labored for the wind? Um, we come from, uh, we, we came empty handed and we go away empty handed. Uh, the great emperor Alexander left his last word. When you carry my coffin, let my both hands out, the stretch out. So it, it, he said that make a hole on the side of the coffin and let my both hands uh, out to show that he didn't carry anything. All that he can, all a man, everything that man, a man carry after death is the sin. So if anybody is, is born in Adam and die in Adam, He's miserable, but we had the moment that we took away the burden of sin, which is the day of our salvation. So when we were saved, we entered the side of Christ. As it is written in the Bible, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things has become new, have become new. So a man in Christ is a blessed man. Coming in Christ itself is a blessing, and living in Christ and dying in Christ is also a great blessing. The Bible gives us the story of Isaac. Isaac is a kind of antitype, a I mean, shadow of Jesus Christ, and the name Isaac has the meaning of laughter. True laughter starts from <clears throat> the moment a man is born again. Um, if a man is not saved, he will mourn and he will be, uh, he will have a lot of remorse because he will fall into the everlasting fire of sin and get to go to heaven by getting salvation. He can finally laugh. So he who enter in Christ and who lives in Christ and die in Christ, he is the blessed. Here we can see very important scripture in verse 13. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Their works means the works that they've done in Christ. It follows them. Their works follow them. The works that they've done in the Lord follow them. So what does that mean? The unsaved, when they die, they cannot carry anything in their hands from all that, it, all that have labored for their lifetime, but their sins. But those, the saved who have lived in Christ and die in Christ, when they enter heaven, When the born again Christians enter heaven, it's not only they themselves who enter heaven, but all their works that they've done since the moment they were saved, the works, they follow them. The works enter the heaven together with them and last forever. Even if there are many zeros, uh, there's no number one in front of the zeros, then the number means nothing. But if there's number one in front of all the zeros, then that makes a huge amount, uh, huge, uh, that makes a big number. So it's really important to have that number one in front of all the zeros, which means getting salvation. So now all our labors that we love one another and work together for the gospel in the Lord, that lasts forever. So sometimes we evangelize and we fail to deliver the soul. That it would be really great if that if he or she gets salvation, but let's say he couldn't. Then will there still be reward? Yes, of course. Think about Noah while he was building an ark. He preached righteousness to many people, but those who were delivered from the flood were only seven members, 
seven family members. But preaching righteousness didn't go nothing, but that remained as a reward. During the time of Jeremiah, the society was really corrupt. The world was corrupt, and Jeremiah was. Called by God, and he preached the gospel for so many years, decades of years. Not many he could deliver. Only Baruch and some others. Only a few people he delivered. He preached the gospel so earnestly, but not many people heard him. But his work to preach the gospel with all his、uh, effort, and that remained as a reward. And it is written in the Bible.、Uh, let's say you enter a village and preach the gospel, and the villagers didn't accept you or didn't accept your the gospel. Then still, the blessing you begged for them will return to you. So preaching the gospel will be a gain to you anyway. If you give just one glass of cold water, then that'll get you a reward. All our life to live together with brethren and love one another, work together. That'll remain forever in heaven. So, how we ought to live as a born again Christian? This is very crucial matter. And when we say, "Oh, there will be the reward in heaven," some people may think, "Oh, I don't need that reward. It's good enough that I can go to heaven." But you don't know how huge the reward would be. It is written in Matthew's Gospel, chapter five. Uh, about the blessings, the beati in beatitude, God is blessing Himself, and、uh, Jesus is God. So He came into the world. So He knew what is the blessing, and Jesus taught us what is the blessing. He said, "Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." So those who can enter、um, heaven, they are blessed. And that beatitude ends with this: Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So those who enter heaven and get reward, he is the blessed. It's not just a, a pay, the reward is not just a paper or a plaque. You need to get some、uh, wisdom about it. Who will get that great glory and reward? Concerning this reward, this is the picture you, you'd better have. You know how huge God is. He created the whole universe, and you know how many galaxies are there in the universe. Some say it would be around one hundred billion or more. And one galaxy consists of how many stars? About one hundred billion stars. So that there will be one hundred billion galaxies. Which consists of 100 billion stars. So we cannot have the full picture how huge the universe is. But here's an example. You know, for your better understanding, I will I will explain in this way. There is a Canada and America and Mexico and so Canada, Canada and America and Mexico. Let's say that size is one galaxy. Then you know how big is the solar system. It would be as small as a cup, and if you drop this cup to this area, Canada or America or Mexico, we don't, we can't find the location where it fell. And that much, our solar system is small. And now you can have a better understanding how huge this galaxy is. And there are one hundred billion galaxies. So let's say、uh, many people got salvation since the time of Adam, but it cannot be over one、um, hundred billion. The population of entire humanity from Adam to the last person will not be over one hundred billion. And if we go to heaven, then we will be praised by God. Oh, you worked so hard! I will give you the reward, and He would give me. What like one galaxy? Because obviously each of us will receive a prize bigger than at least one galaxy. That's huge. This is very important matter. You need to think about it. So how、uh, should we lead our Christian life? We need to get wisdom about it because success in Christian life will be the success of life. Getting praise and glory before the living God would be the success of our life, right? And people in this world, we、uh, there are not many chances that we will see them for a long time. That we won't see them、uh, for a long time. We won't see them again. But God is the one we will see forever. And 
And Jesus Christ, who is God's incarnation, came into the realm of time, and we will see him forever, not just 100 years or 1,000 years or 1 billion years, but we will see him forever. He's the one we're going to live together forever. So the more we think about it, the more we realize that this is very important matter. Heaven is the place we will live together with God forever. And God is love. His nature is love. So we will enter uh, the world full of love. God is joy. So entering heaven means entering the world of joy. God is full of truth and goodness and beauty. beauty. So we're going to enter the place full of truth and goodness and beauty. That is beyond our imagination. The Bible gives us um, um, specific uh, description about heaven. We are going to have the resurrected body and we are going to live in that unsearchable world. So today uh, we are going to learn about how we ought to lead our Christian life to the full and the Bible gives us a simple explanation how we should. Actually, Christian life is not complicated. It's easy and simple. Anybody can lead it. So if you listen carefully tonight, you will understand that Christian life is actually very easy and simple. When a man is born in this world, he is born under the law, under the law. And uh, he realized that he is a sinner and in his lifetime, he commits sins. And he is to be condemned because of those sins. And God, who is beyond the law, came into the world of time. He is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ shed his precious blood on the cross, and he paid the wages of sins forever. And He now he made us righteous. He justified us. So we we became guiltless. And that's thankful enough. But... He kept all the law perfectly instead of us. So he became our righteousness. He has kept all the word of God instead of us. So those who believe in Jesus Christ are considered as those who have kept the word of God. We became the guiltless and we uh, were considered justified. We were considered as the righteous men. Actually, you don't have seen Mm, uh, has different meaning. Um, okay, uh, you are guiltless has a different meaning of you are righteous, right? And the place Jesus was crucified is the place we were executed. We were crucified. Jesus' death is my death. His resurrection is my resurrection. When Jesus died on the cross, I was condemned together with him on the cross. So my fate was done also on the cross. God became my father and I became his son. You know what is um, the great word written in the Bible? It is it. It is it. You are my son. Not only guiltless or not only you're righteous, but it's a huge word. You are my son. By the blood of Jesus Christ, all the wages of our sins were paid and And now we became his sons. And when we pray, Father, that he says, my dear child. And whom does our father hear? He hears the prayer of his son. So he hears our prayer. Those who were redeemed by his blood became his son. And now the sons have the privilege to pray. Some think that long prayer is good, but actually it's not. The first prayer we we do after getting salvation is the prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. Nothing else. Because he uh, solved the problem of sin. He made us righteous. And he. Uh, so at first, we always say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. There's nothing more to say. But as time passes, we get to have more things to pray for. And some people have this misunderstanding. Long prayer is good. That's their misunderstanding. But actually, um, the contents is more important than the length. 
let's say a son <clears throat> went to his father to get some money to buy a book. He knocked on the door and he said, Dear father, honored member of my family, um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you today. So what's, his, what's your point? So the point is important rather than the length. Some give a big speech before God, but God would say, so what's your point? The point is important, isn't it? There was one elder who always prayed a long prayer and in a certain church. And after the Sunday service, he prayed before uh, everybody and he began his prayer starting from Genesis to Revelation, long prayer. And when he opened his eyes, there was no one but the pastor and the, the elder. Everybody went. So the elder said, where's everybody? And the pastor said, well, you prayed too long. So by the time you talked about um, Noah's flood, everyone, everyone was swept by the flood. They went away. So length is not important. The point, what are you praying for? That is important. So born-again Christians are God's sons. There are two kinds of sons. First, obedient son, and second, disobedient son. Both are sons whom, with whom God would be delighted. Yes, the obedient son. So, obeying or disobeying, uh, they are both sons, but God will be delighted with the, the obedient son more, and God will give him the prize and, pr uh, prize and glory. When a baby is born, what does the baby have to learn? Is it math or English? Or obedience yes a child should learn how to obey first so God's child is the same let me give you a quiz your father gave you an errand and what would you do do it when you are told to do or second resist a bit and then do it after a while third resist to the end and kicked out which are you gonna choose yes you have to do it when you are told to do when you are told to do then you have to say yes whom does God use in the church he uses a man who is obedient. Take a good look about it. Not the talented, not the gifted, not the powerful in the world, but those who are obedient. They are useful for the master. So to the obedient son, God promised reward and glory. What about disobedient? God chastens the disobedient son. So if you, once you became a son, then you will be chastened, but you won't be condemned anymore. So it is very important to become a son first. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 and 8 says, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Would you repeat after me? Oh. God deals with you as with sons. God deals with you as with sons. Once you are saved, God deals with you as with sons. Why? Because he bought us. He purchased us at the price of his blood. So now he deals, deal, deals with us as his sons. So it continues. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? The father may leave alone the neighboring kid, but he will strictly chasten his own son. And the Bible says, uh, if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Let's say God's son is going astray and nothing happens, which mean, that means that he might be not the true son. So the father intervenes son's life because he wants his son to be successful and prosperous. So if you do wrong, then God will collect all those faults and he will chasten you later let's say uh, okay uh, so this is chastening when the son goes astray then God uh, beats him to be correct to be to correct him and also uh, in the intimate fellowship between father and son there could be some occasions that the father uh, makes a mistake not a big mistake but some 
small mistakes. And the the son make a confession. Father, I I wronged you. That's a confession. Then the father may say, "All right, don't do it next time," and forgives him. This confession and forgiveness is not, has nothing to do with going to heaven, but it has to do with the intimate fellowship. Whether you confess it or not, you are still the son. But there could be intimate son, close son, and not so much intimate son. Who is more close? Who is closer to the father? If the son doesn't make any mistake, that would be the best. But if even if the son makes a mistake, he confess and begs. Pardon, begs a pardon. Then they can be intimate, right? Now, let's say there's a son who made a mistake, and the fa- the son may think, "Oh, I wish my father comes home late. Oh, my fa- I wish my father goes on a business trip." So when the father comes back home, the father, the son may avoid the father, and the father noticed that oh, he did, did made some mistake, and the son comes and. And beg a pardon. Oh, father, I did did this wrong, and the father will forgive the son. All right, all right, I forgive you. Don't do it next time. And then the fellowship will be restored. So when you make a mistake in your Christian life, you have to make a confession. And what was that for? That is not about condemnation because condemnation was over. It passed over already. So it is for the intimate fellowship. Here is a book, Grand Comprehensive Doctrine, a book for、uh, Christianity, and I'm going to read it. Do saints who have already received righteousness need to repeatedly repent in order to avoid God's judgment? No, they don't. This is because the saints who have already been justified by faith in Christ have been saved and exempted from condemnation from the moment they believed. In other words, God's justification of the saints does not only mean that they have been released from past sins, but also from old, present, and future sins. Therefore, for the saints who have already been saved, repentance of sin has nothing to do with God's punishment. So that、uh, condemnation about sins. Was over on the cross because Jesus paid the penalty of all our sins, so it has nothing to do with the condemnation. Then why do saints need to confess their sins repeatedly? It is to bask a peaceful fellowship with God. So it is for a peaceful fellowship with God. A man who became God's child make a confession about his wrongdoing and turn back, and that is for a, a fellowship. And let's say the son committed a crime intentionally, then the father may chasten him to correct him. That is chasten, chastening. So if、uh, the relationship of God and、uh, father and son is established, there could be the chastening, but not condemnation. You get it? Let's read it here.、Uh, Acts twelve, Acts chapter two, verse thirty-eight. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit will come into the heart of those who are saved, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of adoption. Adoption is、uh, adopting a, a a boy who is not his son as a son. So now we believe in. Jesus, His redemptive work, and that is a proof that Holy Spirit came to us. He whose sins were forgiven became God's son. He who received the remission of sins, he became the son of God because the Holy Spirit is the the spirit of adoption. And the Bible, there's a hymn: "I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within." So those whose sins were saved receive the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not some burning feelings, but it enables us to believe in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Let's sing this hymn together. Psalm, a hymn number two or four. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine! Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood, 
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. We say I share my story, and they say like I prayed a lot, and I had this child. I prayed a lot, and I my business went well. And I prayed a lot, and my son passed the exam. Actually, the true story is the story how you enter heaven. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. Yes, the blood of Jesus. That made the eternal redemption. By the blood of Jesus Christ, all my sins were washed away, and the Holy Spirit enables us to believe in it, and He、uh, He saves us. So you truly believe the the eternal redemption, and that is the proof that Holy Spirit came to you. Those whose sins were saved, those those whose sins were forgiven, are the sons of God. We say we got salvation, and that means all our sins were forgiven. We were justified. We became God's children. Our soul was redeemed, and it is written in First Peter: receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When we say we got salvation, and that means Jesus paid the penalty of all our sins, and our soul will not perish, will not. Uh, be destroyed anymore. That is salvation. When we receive the remission of sins, Holy Spirit came to us, and those who is united with the Spirit of God、uh, became one. We became one. The Holy Spirit came into us, and He witnesses that we are children of God. But here's one thing you need to know: by the blood of Jesus. All the wages of sin was paid, but to us there's this part soma and sarx. Sarx soma is in English body. Sarx is sinful nature. It sarx is flesh in English, and which means sinful nature. We say we were born again, but still we have that sinful nature that was inherited from Adam. From the moment we were saved until we stand before the Lord on His second advent, this sinful nature doesn't go away. So then, when will it go away? When the Lord comes again, then we will be glorified because He bought even our body at a price—the price of His blood. So when He、uh, glorifies our body, that sinful nature that was inherited from Adam will be destroyed. So when the Lord comes again, our even our body will be turned into the glorious body that won't sin again. The wages of sin was paid, and yet still we have that sinful nature. When I was born again, I thought that I would become holy, I would become really godly. I thought that when um I, when I was born again, I thought I won't sin again. So when I was in school、uh, days. I did some. I I studied a lot how a man won't sin in his life. I knew that people, when a man dies, he'll be buried in the grave, and I didn't know what awaits him after the grave. So I was really afraid of that. So I thought if I、uh, live against my conscience, then I'll be in trouble because I don't know what awaits me after that grave. So I tried to live a holy life. I tried very hard to live a good life, but、uh, in my school days,、uh, sin constantly came up from my heart. So I had a lot of thought about it. And when I listened to the Bible seminar, I could believe that there is God. When I had a Bible seminar, I when I had a counseling, and with that two hours of counseling, I realized that truly God lives. Truly, there is God, and I realized that I couldn't go to heaven.
because when as soon as I realized that there is God, I found my I found out my sins. But at the time, uh, they didn't give me the answer right away. They didn't、uh, share with me the good news. But he it gave me just hard time to to think about my my sinful my sin. And when I went to my friend's house, I saw my friend's mother, and that the mother looked so godly and good, very virtuous. And I thought that a good,、uh, his her inner person is really good. And so I really wanted to get salvation, and I, because I wanted to emulate her. And then in 1983, September 25, I got saved, and I was so happy. John's Gospel, chapter one, verse one says, "Behold,、uh, chapter one, verse twenty nine. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." Through that scripture, I realized that Jesus took all all my sins and died on the cross. I could have a full understanding, and I could believe、uh, in the forgiveness of sins by the by His redemptive work. And then, when I came out from the church building, the sky looked different, the tree looked different. And I said, "Oh, this is so true that God created all these things." So I was so happy when I was saved. But then, as time passed, that sinful nature came up from my heart. That was weird. All my sins were forgiven. Why still I have this sinful nature? And I tried to pu- push it back, but it was really hard to. Control it. I prayed so earnestly. I locked the door, and and in the room, I prayed so、um, earnestly. But still, I I had the sins. So I said, "Oh, it's weird. I was forgiven. I was saved. Why I still have this sinful nature?" And later, I as I was studying the Bible, I realized that this sinful nature might be weakened, but it doesn't go away. And from this scripture, I I said, "Aha." First、uh, Peter chapter three verse twenty one, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. This scripture was given to the born again Christians. But even if you, a man is born again, it doesn't remove the filth of the flesh. The wages of sin was paid, but that sinful nature、uh, doesn't disappear. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. So now the born again Christians have a good conscience to live according to the word of God. But the filth of the flesh is not removed. So still it's there. Just look into your heart. Will you piss off when somebody push your button? You will be pissed, right? And another scripture in John's Gospel, chapter three, verse six: That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's right. Actually, we our my spirit was saved, but my flesh is still the flesh. The salvation is the salvation of the spirit. My spirit was saved, but still my flesh was not saved. My flesh still has the sinful nature. Actually, Christians when they are saved, they realize their sins. They they can find their sins. Even more, before they were saved, they thought they were a good person, good people. But after they get salvation, they、uh, realize all the more that they are really sinful. In the past, a long time ago, there were、um, the houses. In traditional Korean housing is has the paper window, and an old man was having a meal inside of the room. But the window pa- paper window has holes in it, and sun streak lines、uh, came through the hole, and that through the hole, the dancing dust was seen. But only through that you know, the hole, the sunlight was show- showing. So. The the in the eyes of the old man, there was du- dancing dust in that area. So he moved his table to the an- to other side and had meals there, just like that. Still, there the possibility of commit all kind of sins is in me. But when we are saved, now sunlight, the light of God, is shine is shown. So we realize all the more. I'm really sinful. I have. I'm really corruptible. So we can fully understand that why Jesus had to die. Actually, before I was saved, 
I had a big misunderstanding. I thought that if anybody marries me, she's a lucky girl. I'm a good person. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do anything wrong. So I thought I was a good person. But after marriage, I realized that that was not, was not true. As I was studying the Bible, I, re- I found, found out that I had all the possibilities of committing sins. I realized that I was not a good, good person. And after salvation, we can feel all the more that we are really corrupt and sinful. The wages of sin was paid, and yet still we have sinful nature. And it got me question. then why didn't God take away this sinful nature? Without this sinful nature, we could have lived like an angel. Why do we still have that sinful nature? That we can, without sinful nature, we may live uh, like an angel. A, we can live a good life. So I did some research about it and I had three conclusions. So have a look at this. After we are saved, now we are in this situation. The rat and the bird tied together with a string. The rat represents a sinful nature. And the bird is the spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit tried to go upward and the rat tried to go into the hole. And like this, sometimes it, it goes to that way, sometimes this way. And the sinful nature doesn't go away. When our spirit is weakened, it's dragged, dragged to the side of the rat. But when it becomes strong, then it can soar up. That red doesn't go away, even if it can be, it may be weakened. So after salvation, there's a spiritual battle. Who wins? The stronger one wins. When we feed our inner person well, then the inner person will be strengthened and lead our Christian life to the full. But if we watch TV all the time and live a worldly life, secular life, then we will be uh, driven to the side of the red. Then why did God remain the sinful nature? There's the reason. There could be some reasons, and I, I want to just mention three reasons. First, it is to um, make us know more in depth of God's grace and love. Let's say a baby's born, he poops and pees, and, and, and let's say he doesn't have that process, but he just runs right after birth. And he learns Hebrew language, Greek language, and speaking English. He's perfect. That baby. He may know the grace of the mother who has given birth, but not anything else. Because he did it all by on his own. If we can become perfect right after salvation, then we may understand the saving grace that Jesus died on the cross and and redeemed us from our sins, but not any other grace that continues. But let's say a baby's born and pee and poo and make troubles and make his clothes dirty, playing outside and he makes all the troubles, but the parents never leave him alone, never abandon him, help him, carry him, feed him, educate him. And through that process, the baby can understand in depth the love and grace of the parents, not only the grace of giving birth, but also the grace of raising. The baby can understand what is the width and length and depth and height of the love of the mother. Just like that, the saved, the born again Christians, we became God's children. But when the Holy Spirit shines on us, we can see the filth in our life. Sometimes we fall down in our Christian life, sometimes slip away. But only because of one reason that we were saved, we became God's children. God never leaves us alone. He raises us up when we fall down. He solves the problems that we are struggling with. Sometimes he chastens us when we are, when we does wrong, when we do wrong. And as time passes, what do we understand? We are able to comprehend what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ. Now, one year have passed, two years. Over time, we can understand that God is love. He is gracious. And behind my back, 
follows His love and grace all the time. His mercy and truth always follows. And even if we fall down seven times, He raises up the eighth time. He never give up on us. That's what we understand. So we can comprehend the width and length of God's love more and more. So we can truly understand that God is full of grace. The more we see the insufficiency, the more we see um, the how we are short, the more we can understand that God is helping us with His grace. And secondly. God wants to see us loving Him in our daily life. God is love. So He wants to be loved by us. He is hurt. Sometimes He's hurt because of us. Parents grieve over children. Sometimes they are hurt. Sometimes they are troubled. But sometimes they rejoice. Because of children, they rejoice greatly and grieve big time. God is also um, the person. There, there's a personhood of God. He has emotions and personality. It's not simply an impersonal force. He rejoices and grieves. And it's less valuable that a man loves someone because that is the only option. But even if we have our sinful nature and there are many other options and other temptations, and yet still we love God alone because of His grace, then then God will be pleased with us. For example, a father brought a, a pack of snake and gave it to the child and a children, and one son just snatched it and ran away and ate it alone. Uh, on the other hand, another son opened it and gave one to the father. Daddy, have it. Let's share it. And that's different, right? The one, uh, We received God's grace and love, but how we manif- uh, how we show our love to Him, you know, voluntarily. That pleased the Lord. But let's say on the mountainside, there's only uh, one man and one woman, and they say each other, I love you so much. I cannot live without you. Me too. Actually, there are only two of them, so it's not so valuable, right? But in the city, there are so many men and women and so many temptations, but they keep their chastity. Then that much it is valuable. So we have temptations around us. There are secular things tempting us, and we have the the lust and desires. And yet, our love toward God is so big. So we overcome those temptations, and we keep ourselves holy, and we serve the Lord that is a life to please the Lord. When we show our, our gratitude and, and our love to God, then God will delight with us. When we go to heaven, we don't have the sinful nature, so there's, there's no option anymore but to love Him only. So from this moment while we are living in this world, we can show that we truly love Him voluntarily. This is a very precious chance for us to show our love toward God. And third, third reason is this. He saved us. And not to give, uh, that is to give us not only salvation, but also um, everlasting glory. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 10 says, Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Not only to take us to his kingdom, but also to give us everlasting glory. Eternal glory. He wants to give us eternal glory. That is huge. So he wants to give it to us. This eternal glory is given to those whose Christian life is good. There's the eternal glory God wants to give us to the saved. So he remained us three enemies to defeat. That is, firstly, that sinful nature, our flesh. The, one of the enemies is the sinful nature. And second, that is the temptation of this world. And third, it's the devil, 
Satan. Satan won't snatch our spirit from God's hand, but still it can make us stumble. So in our Christian life, we have to control our sinful nature. We have to go through the sinful world wisely. And third, we have to overcome the devil. Then we will be rewarded and we will get the eternal glory. It would be really great if all of us uh, lead our Christian life to the full, but not many do that. But we fail because of these three enemies. Some people, some Christians are trapped by Satan. It would be great if all of us lead our Christian life to the full, but not many, not all. There are three kinds of things Satan hates. Would he uh, like? Would he uh, want us to lead our Christian life, life to the full or not? When we live good, and the Satan um, really hate it. So what do we have to do? We have to do exactly opposite of what he likes. There are things Satan hates. So we have to do that. What uh, we have to do? What Satan hates. So what is the first thing that he hates? He uh, he hates us to trust in the the blood of Jesus. So the Satan always say, "Don't talk about the blood of Jesus." Through this week, in the past week, you always talk about the blood. Don't do it. Hebrews chapter nine verse twelve. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Well, you talked about it last Friday and then Saturday night again, and today again on Sunday morning you are talking about it. Jesus himself, with his own blood, he uh, have he had have a, he has obtained eternal redemption, and he entered the most holy place once for all, and. Satan hates to hear the blood of Jesus. All my sins consist of the sins in the past, present, and future. And Jesus uh, obtained eternal redemption, which means he uh, redeemed us from the sins in the past and present and future. All of it. That's eternal redemption. The blood of Jesus, our Lord, washed away all my sins. Once for all, that is what Satan hates here. And Satan whispers in our ears, just believe in his blood partly, not fully, partly. Let's say this is my sin. And the Satan whispers to us, only half of it was saved. Only the past sins were saved, not the other half. Or the, it's, they say, almost all were saved, but not that one sin. Not that one sin that you uh, had an abortion. That was not forgiven. That's what they whisper. But it's 100%. It is finished. 100% it is finished. So there's no room for our own works. Satan tried to make us believe partly, not fully. Because if uh, a man believes in the blood of Jesus fully, then Satan will lose his own prey, right? And secondly, second thing uh, Satan hates is for Christians to draw near to the Bible. When a man draws near to the Bible, then Satan's strategy is revealed and he will be loved by God. He will be found favor in the eyes of God. He'll live under God's grace. That is why Satan always whisper, don't read the Bible. Look at that, Satan. Hey, hey, man, don't read the Bible. Don't draw near to the scripture. They are whispering to your ears. Don't read the Bible. But our Lord Jesus is delighted when we draw near to his word. When we read his word, this is how we feel. God is hugging us. You know how much he's delighted with us when we read his word? Drawing near to his word is to draw near to draw near to God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The word was what? The word was God. So drawing near to the Bible is drawing near to God. Loving the word of God is loving God. Anybody who Keep a distance, stay away from the word of God, stays away from, stays away from the word of God, he stays away from God.
And third, Satan hates Christians to be connected to the true church, which whose in of which foundation is the Lord Jesus. Okay, you can go, uh, you can go to church, but go to just any church, any nominal church. Actually, there are many uh, quake doctors, and some people they ruin their health by seeing a quake doctor. They we have to find the right hospital, good hospital. And our spirit is more important than our body, so we have to find the true church. When uh, now we were saved, we have many unbelieving family members, friends, family members, and relatives, and it's God's plan that uh, their souls will be delivered through me, the thirty, sixty, one hundred beloved. So where do we? Where do I have to lead my Christian life that I can deliver the lost souls? 30, 60, 100 lost souls will be delivered through the mouth, through my mouth. So when we think about it, we can understand where we should stand. We have to find the true church of which foundation is Jesus Christ, and we have to abide in it. Once we are connected to the church, then we'll be provided by God's word, and our, our life will be changed, and we can deliver the lost souls, 30, 60, 100. But Satan whispers to us, it's it's okay that and now it's okay you got salvation so you don't need to go to that church anymore that's all that's good enough to lead our christian life to the full uh, we need to know something important not many knowledge is required but we need to know the most important point we are living in a society of many informations we collect all kinds of informations but we don't know what is important here, uh, a hedgehog knows one thing for sure. Hedgehog knows uh, one thing, which is to roll in his body, rolling up his body. Fox knows many things. They are cunning and, and she wrote. But foxes, they are eaten by a predator. But the hedgehogs, they are not eaten by predators much because when they are in... In danger, they roll up their body. It's neither shape of body, so they are protected. So you need to know one thing for sure, even if it's not many informations, many knowledge. For the unsaved, as of the uns as for the unsaved, they have to know the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. They have to understand uh, what they have to do with the blood of Jesus. Then the life problem will be solved. When, be, before I was born again, I saw this sign on a wall, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But as soon as I got salvation, I could have a full understanding of that scripture. Yes, the truth is the blood of Jesus. Jesus is the truth. His blood is the truth. The Bible is the truth. When we understand the meaning of the blood of Jesus, we were set free. Set free from Sin, death, judgment, and eternal destruction. We were set free from all that. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So we were set free from our sins. If a man do not understand the meaning of Jesus' blood, they don't understand what is liberation. What does this mean that he can, set, he can be free from sins and condemnation? So as for the unsaved, they have to uh, realize the meaning of Jesus' blood first. And as for the saved, as for the saved, we have to know our position and keep our position. We have to keep our position. There are physical position and spiritual position. And when we keep these two positions, then we can lead our Christian life well. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 16 says, For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. What does that mean? Here we can see the husband and a wife. Let's say they lived happily married 
And one day, the husband alone got saved, or the wife alone got saved, and that may cause some conflict and problem in the family. And the conflict、uh, it becomes severe. They maybe they feel like to get a divorce, but the Bible says, "How do you know a wife?" So, so here in this sentence, wife was saved. How do you know a wife whether you will save your husband, or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? So your spouse may get salvation through you, but as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. So if the husband is a Christian, then the husband may deliver the soul of the wife. So do your duty and take good care of your wife. Treat him, treat her better. If the wife is a Christian, then the Bible tells her, "How do you know that you would deliver your husband? So love your husband, do the house chores, take good care of your children, keep your position well." Let's say you are called、uh, as you are、um, worker. First Corinthians chapter seven verse twenty. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Are were you called? When you are a worker in a company or a student, yeah, ha- they have to keep their position. For students, they have to study hard. If a student is born a Christian, then actually they have to study really, really hard. As much as he w- he would hear, oh, stop, stop studying anymore. You are studying too much. Are you doing that? Do you have to hear this? Hear this? Hear it from your parents? Oh, please stop studying. You are studying too much. I'm sorry to say this, but I heard it a lot when I was a student. My mom always said, "Please, please stop studying. Take some rest." I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying this. So here it says, the Bible says, "Do you see a person who is、uh, faithful in his business? These kind of men will stand before a king and not before、um, a low, low person." So. Look at that person who is very、uh, faithful in his business; that he will be honored. We were called as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So the position where we were called is the position that we need to be. That is why we have to be faithful to in that position. We spend only a short time in the church. You know, in a week,、uh, sparing we spare twenty four、uh, hours, and then what about the the rest six days? So actually, our daily life is our Christian life, including those six days. So for as for housewife, cooking rice and doing laundry is Christian life. For farmers doing farming, that is Christian life. For students studying is their Christian life. Our daily life is the Christian life. Joshua chapter twenty four. Joshua said, "As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." This word "serve" is is used in Genesis chap、uh, in the book of Genesis and in Hebrew language. It has the meaning of cultivation, cultivate till the ground. So our、uh, daily life is very connected to、uh, the Christian life. The Bible says in Colossians chapter three verse twenty three, whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. Our daily life is very Christian life. It happened in the states. There was one successful man, and he shared the secret of his success. I was very poor when I was young, and there was one rich man. So the ma- madam and that rich. A、man、uh, called me. Hey boy, would you mow the lawn of my front yard? So he was because I was very poor. I said yes and mow the lawn for her. For her and the mom saw it and said, "Oh, you did a job worth of one one dollar today. Here goes your one dollar." And after a while, he she called again. So he he did it more sincerely. And then she said, "You did a job worth of two dollars today." And she paid two dollars. And later she asked her again. So this time he did it wholeheartedly. He did his best, very sincerely, and moved some grass here and there and did his best. And then the mothers and the the woman said, 
Finally, you did a job worth of five dollars today. So, from now on, when you whatever you do, do the job worth of five dollars, not just one or two dollars. And that word was in his heart. So since then, whatever he did, he did his best. He did it wholeheartedly, and because of that reason, he got a huge success. So our daily life is the Christian life. So from the position you are called, you have to do your best. You have to be faithful. It happened in a dorm in a university in the states. The dorm mates were gathered together, and they said, "Should we study today or go out to play?" So let's flip a coin. Okay, if coin comes up heads or tails, we go out play. If the coin stands erect, we study. So and they flip the coin. Everybody went out to play. They forgot their duty as a student. So it's very important to keep the position. And if you think your position doesn't fit, then you have to get、um, enough counsel with the Lord, and the Lord will give you the way of escape. So you have to have a counseling about it. The Bible says in First、uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirteen: "No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it." To the born again Christians. Temptation is given, but under、uh, control. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So, when you face temptation or trials or difficulties, you have to understand that it will be under the control. So, don't worry too much about it. And if you think your position is not good, not、um, appropriate, then God will give you the, the way of escape. So don't give up in any situation. So don't worry about it. The the mother already knows it, already knows it. The video is is、uh, cut here because of copyright. And that it was about the bird、uh, jumping off the cliff and falling down. Though the baby bird hit the rock a lot, he he survived, and the mother knows it, knows that the baby bird will survive. So that that much God knows、uh, that we can overcome it. And when it is too much, He will give He gives us the way of escape that we can be able to bear it. And secondly, and more importantly, we have to keep the pos- the spiritual position. Here it says,、um, the God's command was given to the born again Christians: abide in the Lord. Let's find some scripture. This is very important scripture. John's Gospel, chapter fifteen. John's Gospel, chapter fifteen. John's Gospel, chapter fifteen. I'm going to read chapter fifteen, verse three. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine; you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. A few years back, a young man approached it to me, and he said, "I was born again, but many brothers, church brothers, always came to me to have fellowship, and I was so tedious of that; it was too much. I was told to abide in the fellowship, so I went there, but it's too much." And he complained, "It's good enough that I got salvation. Why do I have to abide in the fellowship?" So I told him, "Okay, let's open the Bible." And then I showed John fifteen three to him. 
you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So are you cleansed? And he said, yes, yes, I was cleansed by the, by the blood of Jesus. That's for sure. So I said, okay, the Bible continues, abide in me and I in you. Abide in me. Is it optional or is it a command? And then he saw that and he answered, oh, it's a command. Whose command is it? Well, it's the command of Jesus Christ. So what should he do? Oh, well, I think I have to abide in him. So I said, all right, go ahead. You have to abide in him. And he said, okay. So he he's a, was um, a good uh, person. He had a good character. Why do we have to abide in Christ? Because the Lord... The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords commanded us to abide in Him. So why do we have to abide in Him? The Lord is the brand, uh, the Lord is the vine, and we are the branches. I'm the vine; you are the branches. Branches have uh, the responsibility to attach to the vine. When we are attached, we'll be provided the nourishment. And then we can bring forth fruits naturally. I'm the vine, you're the branches. So as long as we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. So in other words, the Bible says, Christ is the head of the church, head. And the church is his body. Each born again Christians are each members of the body, body parts. So attaching to the vine as a branch is like abiding in the body. In other words, the, um, the group of the born again Christians is the church. Church is in Greek language, ecclesia, ecclesia. That is the group of people who are born again. And its head is Jesus Christ. So we attach to the vine as a branch. And that means we are connected to the head as a body part. When we are connected and be nourished, we can lead our Christian life to the full naturally. That is how God set up. Church is ecclesia in Greek language, uh, and that has the meaning of the called out, the called out who were purchased by God, by the price of Jesus' blood. And uh, our association is called fellowship, and God works in us. That is why this uh, the group of boring and Christian is the temple of God. So when we keep our position and well connected, we'll be provided of the nourishment of God. So our life will be changed and we will be able to lead our Christian life to the full. That is the method God made. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine in which is past you know, dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. After we were saved, we have to think uh, think deeply where we should belong. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 11 says, There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the, off the earth and the needy from among men. There is um, a disobedient group of people. There, are, there is an uh, arrogant group of people. There are a cruel and violent uh, group of people who have a covetousness. There are various kinds of groups. So which group do we have to belong? Which group will you draw near? Be careful who you trust. Born again Christians should be near with born again Christians. They shake hands. You might be bite bitten. They look friendly. They see the knife at the back. You have to be very careful of people. Be careful of people. Whom do we have to stay close? We have to stay close to the born-again Christians. Jesus said in John's Gospel, In an other ship I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Our Lord Jesus is our shepherd, and those 
who were saved by his blood are one flock and will be in one sheep pen. So we have to be connected to the flock. Then we can be protected. Walking together with the Lord is good. The Lord protects the, uh, his sheep in the sheep pen. Satan tried to knock me over. Take a look at this. He is sticking out his tongue, teasing. It means that I am not afraid of you, Satan. He um, doesn't need to be afraid of the lion because of the, because the wall is protecting him. So where can we be secure when we are together with the born again Christians? When we are in the sheep pen, we are safe. We need to lead our Christian life to the full. And what do we need for that purpose? Where would you spend your time? Or for what would you spend your time? There was one professor who was teaching about success. And he had a lecture about how can a man get success? Why people fail? And he shared the secret how. And we need to know the secret how we can get a success in our Christian life. So that professor gave an example, gave a parable. Here is a big jar. And sand was filling half of the jar. And outside of the jar was laid various size of rocks. And there's no one who could put all those rocks inside of the jar. And the professor gave a demonstration. He poured out, poured all the sand out and put the biggest rock at the center and the smaller rocks uh, around on the side. And then he poured the sand back and it could fill. And he continued, you know why we fail in the life? We shouldn't move the most important thing at the center. We shouldn't move it. It should stay there at the center. But the trivial things are too many. And because of that, the, the center axis is pushed off. To be successful, you have to keep the central axis. It shouldn't move. The most important thing in our Christian life is the Word of God. So the time to listen to the Word of God is the most important so for us, Wednesday sermon and Sunday sermon is important. Don't say, I'm going to go to the Sunday service and when I'm available or Wednesday service and I'm available, then actually you cannot um, get a success in your Christian life. So in a week, you have to prioritize the Word of God at the center and all the other things, you, you lay aside the other things and you, uh, you do the other jobs um, some other time. The, the God-centered life, God-centered life is word-centered life. When we put the word of God as our top priority, then God's word will change my mind. God's word will change my life. And that um, the time to listen to his word is the most important time for me. God-centeredness is God-first mind. God-first mind. When we lead a God-first life, then we will receive his help as well. We have to receive God's help. And how can we receive his help? We have to put our top priority on God alone. That is how we can receive his help. Don't say, um, I'm going to go to church when I'm available. Then not long after, you will be um, hindered by Satan. So just uh, make a decision to be there 
for the word of God all the time. Some people, some Christians, they, uh, they don't have time to come to Wednesday sermon. But you know what? If you um, delight in the Lord, God will make a way. God will help you to join it. Let's say there's a one month schedule and there's a the cell group fellowship or mother's group fellowship. And you have to put your top priority on those the fellowships and word of God. Then something miraculous will happen. You will receive God's help in your life, and your life, your Christian life, will be prosperous. The Bible says, "Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit." So drunkenness is quite similar to、um, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. There's the pattern to be drunk. And if we adjust, we, if we apply the same pattern to Christian life, it it goes the same. So to be drunk, what should we do? It's simple. Just join drinking parties often, and also drink a lot, giving and taking many glasses, and join it to the end, the first round, second round, the third round. And this man will be drunk, and the heaven, will, sky will look like just handkerchief, and he won't feel any pain on his body. So just like that, what should we do to be filled with the Holy Spirit? This is also simple: join the fellowship often, spend enough time together, sharing your Christian life, and join it to the end. Then this person will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and his Christian life will be full of funs. So this is not Christian life. If you lead your Christian life by your own efforts, you cannot go far. By rowing the boat, he cannot go. He cannot go far. It cannot be.、Uh, it cannot be done by your own effort. But you have to be helped by the Holy Spirit. Abide in the fellowship. Learn the word of God together with brethren. Then the Holy Spirit will work in you. It's just like a sailing boat sails with a wind. When there is a wind, it does. The boat goes constantly. Though the ship is bound to the land, when it is full blown by the wind, the rope will be just cut out, and it can go. Some say, "I cannot quit drinking. I cannot quit quit smoking." But don't worry about it. If you abide in the fellowship, then you will quit all those old habits, drinking or smoking or even drugs, narcotic. I mean, it's it will be cut out. It's easy when. And actually, it will be easy for you to cut out bad friends when they come to you to hang out. Then you can show them the Bible seminar, the long session of Bible seminar, and let's watch it together. Then they will just go away. They will stop coming to you. You can cut out bad friends. So if you abide in the fellowship, you will be provided by the Holy Spirit, and you can lead your Christian life successfully. You can cut out all the other old habits, but not the appetite, not the desires of eating, because that's just an instinct, human instinct. So it doesn't, you cannot cut it out. If you abide in the fellowship, you can lead your Christian life naturally. Look at the seashells; it it has a strong attachment on the rock. It doesn't、uh, fall out once it is attached. Born again Christians should attach strongly. To the church, then you can lead your Christian life naturally. Here's a firm grip, and one of the things you have to take a firm grip is prayer, and personal study, ministry, and meetings, doing church services, and having fellowship. It's important. So attach. To the born again Christians, and you will experience something amazing. Among the birds, some birds who have to flut, flutter their wings, it's hard, hard for them to fly. But for the hawks or eagles, they use the wind. The hawks, they fly so peacefully without so much energy. When you come to church at first. When you are newly born again Christians, it's like fluttering wings. Oh, it's so hard to join the fellowship. It's so hard, but not long after, it'll be natural. You will stretch your your wings, and Christian life will become easier and natural, and you will be strengthened more. So we need to meet our Lord as we are living faithfully. 
As long as you abide in the fellowship, you will be provided by the Lord Jesus, and you will understand the scriptures. You will have strength to pray or do church services or evangel evangelize your friends. So as long as you keep your position, you can lead your Christian life naturally. So it's easy and simple. It's the Lord's duty and responsibility to change me, and it's your responsibility to attach to it. As long as you are uh, abiding in the fellowship, you'll be changed. Is it difficult or easy? It's easy and simple, right? So it's important to abide in the fellowship. We don't have much time today, so from now on, I'm going to share with you why we have to join the Lord's Day Supper. Why do we have Lord's Day Supper? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I'm going to read, For I received from the Lord that which I also did deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So first reason we have Lord's Supper is... In remembrance of Jesus Christ. Lord's Supper is the command we received from the Lord Jesus himself. That is why we are having it um, once in a while. So when we have Lord's Supper, we break bread. You know why we take bread and we break bread? Here it says, uh, the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was uh, it betrayed took bread. He took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. And uh, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we do it in remembrance of Jesus. Today, we are going to take bread and take the cup. By his body is torn down, we were saved. So we commemorate his death. And we take the cup. We drink wine, and by that, we remember Jesus' blood. So the first reason we are having this uh, Lord's Supper is to commemorate our Lord Jesus. And the second reason is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. When we take bread, we, we break it from one, one loaf, one bread. Also, when we uh, take the cup, we participate in his body, in his blood, which uh, represents the one community. So there's one bread and we all partake of that one bread. Why? Because we are many, but we are one body. Though we are many, we are one body. That is why we have one bread. We were called to love one another in the Lord. We, we will live together forever in heaven. So even in this world, we love one another, we share faith together to show the group, uh, sh show that we are uh, sharing the common destiny, we take part in that one bread. And third reason is written here. Um, when... Uh, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What does that mean? Jesus died on the cross. And he is to come the second time. And we remind each other of his death. And we remind each other of our ministry until he comes again. The ministry to preach his gospel we are living here in this world to preach the gospel 
So the third reason we are having this Lord's Supper is to proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What does that mean? Unworthy manner. Unworthy manner. What does that mean? Lord's Supper is done to commemorate the Lord and to live a God-centered life. And it is to love one another and it is to proclaim the proclaim the Lord's sup, Lord's death till he comes. And what is unworthy manner? After we got saved, now we lead a um, God-centered life. But if anybody live a self-centered life or egocentric life, it's unworthy. Christians should love one another in the Lord. We share the same destiny. But if we are indifferent with each other or even hate each other, that is unworthy. Third, we have to proclaim his death until his coming. But if we are indifferent, uh, if we do not care of the lost souls around us, then we are unworthy. Some may ask, oh, we, shouldn't, we drink, shouldn't we drink? But think about it. If you try to, if you're going to deliver the lost soul, can you do it as drinking alcohol? Believe in Jesus. It's good. Can you do that? Why do we have to stop smoking? Just imagine you are smoking in front of unbelievers and say, believe in Jesus, it's good. Will they hear you? If you have any mind to evangelize their souls, then we sacrifice ourselves, sometimes treat them with nice meals, and we, we show uh, the godly life. Our, our Christian life is to deliver those lost souls. So when we take part in this Lord's Supper, we need to reflect on ourselves, whether we are living God-centered life and whether we are loving one another and whether we care about the lost souls around us. We need to examine ourselves. Let us all pray together. Our merciful Father, we thank you for redeeming us by your precious blood and for promising us your heavenly kingdom. Until you come again, we want to love one another and we want to proclaim your gospel. We want to lead, uh, live for your glory. So please help us to live so. We thank you that you, you've given us this opportunity to take part in this ministry and work together for your gospel. We um, commit our whole being to you for the rest of our life. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.